around. And it's an interesting interview because I think for most of us who kind of grew up during this era, especially um, when Hood Bayer was kind of a thing in fashion and they were doing their amazing fashion shows that they were basically taking on tour, which I don't think anyone's done. Which again, which I don't think anyone has done going forward. I don't think anyone has kind of done that same sort of thing where you take your your fashion collection and you essentially show it at all the main fashion weeks around the world, whether it's Milan, Paris, London, New York. And they were the first to kind of do that. You know, they did collaborations with Selfridges in a parking lot. I remember going to that back in the day with all the skaters. Like, they did some really cool and amazing things. Um, and again, just a really impactful and cool, interesting kind of dude, right? And they have this really, really great interview where they kind of speak about their origin story. I think I've got it up here on the screen, right? Talking about Andre's story with Kerwin Frost, but this one little bit really, really um, hit home to me that I kind of want to highlight to you guys here. I think it's Twitter. What minute is this? I think it might be 23, 80. Let's see if I can get up on here. Da, 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 da. Let's see if I can get up. Is that what? Is that what it's going to be? Okay, cool. Let's play this. So, I mean, there are people that are, I think they're really intelligent people that are like, uh, playing dumb. Good. Yeah. They're playing dumb. Yeah. And doing good jobs at, like, at least leading people in positive direction. Yeah. And being positive towards what could the possibility of, of street kids, street culture, and keeping it open. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that they're teaching anyone uh, or showing new things or showing new things uh, that have not happened in fashion art. Yeah, right now it's kind of on like groundhog. It's like yeah. everyone is ignorant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's crazy. Yeah, that's tomorrow will be the same crazy. and it will be the same again. Yeah. And then you look at your category, it's like, like, am I going crazy? Like, am I like, and, and you start thinking about yourself. Great retweets. Because you start thinking that. Yeah. And, and you're just like, wait, like, did I miss something? Or, which I kind of agree with, and it's something that's just, it's a really, um, they're talking about, you know, there is no kind of real innovation or people really pushing the envelope as much as it probably should be in fashion, which kind of, I think, speaks to kind of the collective malaise going on in the industry now, which I don't really think is a bad thing. I think essentially what happened was that fashion essentially pierced through to the mainstream. It became, it became a thing that everyone was sort of interested in or kind of got interest with. I kind of parlay it to the rise of sneakers, the, the rise of sneaker culture, to the rise of streetwear, to the rise of music, to the rise of culture in general, right? To even to the rise of festivals. Um, it's not that uncommon to hear of a kid going out to, you know, I don't know, the middle of the country to go to a festival to go see a particular electronic artist that they've just been put on to by because they, they did a collaboration with a streetwear brand they like, right? And festivals are now, you know, they're, they're ten a penny. They're all over the place. Brands are all over the place. Fashions are all over the place. Um, Fashion is kind of, for lack of a better term, being democratized in that sense, right? It's not the most elite. It's not for the elite class anymore. Luxury for some people like Eugene Rebkin has been kind of reduced to kind of really luxurious kind of quote unquote hoodies and jeans and trainers, which, you know, people like Eugene Rebkin and all those kind of, you know, elite snobby kind of dudes are not really a fan of because they all come from the the era of the avant-garde right where people were pushing things forward the things were not readily available it was a hat where you had to kind of really earn your stripes to kind of have the ability even to kind of buy the items it was a real high bar of entry now the bars could be lowered somewhat for entry and also for creation so i think if you're a really talented designer or if you're a really talented musician it kind of behooves you if you want to get your music out there and get spread to the most people i think there is a small number of contingent of artists out there who are still doing things the right way and doing the things about the music and really trying to make something that really kind of tested that lasts that test the that lasts the test of time it's also impactful that's going to touch people but for the most part there is a there is this idea that some people are dumbing it down right because that's what is needed at the moment right um you get a lot of artists say, a lot of the mumble rapper kids um, say a lot, especially some of their closest friends, you hear them talk where they say, no, this guy can actually rap, right? He's just doing this because this is what's in at the moment. Um, and I don't really begrudge the kids for doing that when they're rapping. And I also don't begrudge designers for kind of dumbing it down when it comes to clothing, right? At the, essentially, we're living in a really weird uh, post-merch kind of era, right? Where everything kind of looks like luxury merch in a sort of sense, right? No one's really designing or cutting or draping or creating new shapes, new silhouettes, new fabrications. Um, everyone's kind of really doing the same sort of thing, right? 
But I think in general, what was happening is that we're having loads of new players, which is a good thing. And I think over time, what we'll see is that that kind of trend will die down or that kind of style or that kind of aesthetic will kind of go away. And the people that are talented and who can do more things will evolve with it. And the ones that can't will kind of fade away. But I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. I just think it's a moment in time that we're living. And I think in general, again, like I said, I think, I think it's a good thing, right? I think because look at it from the real like uh, practical sense of the way, word, right? I don't think you can't. I don't think there's anything you could wear right now in that's classified as fashion or classified as fashionable or it's classified as trendy or it's classified as um, um, of the moment. There's nothing that you could wear right now that would get you turned away from a club or a bar, unless it's like a tracksuit ball from Nike Town, and even then it would probably be something that could probably get you into um, a children firehouse, uh, you know, a Mr. Chow's. Uh, whatever it is, right? Whatever members club you want to get into, right? I, I'm pretty sure there's nothing that you could buy nowadays that would actually get you turned away. And that's a real, real step in the right direction because essentially, you know, luxury has, you know, reduced itself to basically Gucci tracksuits, right? That is a form of luxury now, right? The idea that you can wear that kind of an item um, during a brunch or during some um, some dinner with some friends and stuff and then you can maybe take off the jacket, uh, tuck your shirt into your trousers, put on some nice shoes and go to the club and no one can bat an eyelid, Right? Um, I think that's pretty cool. Um, again, it might change, it might evolve, but I think that what it does is that it invites a lot of new players into the game. And over, I think over time, once that kind of thing evolves and people's taste um, level, it gets a little bit more refined and you maybe as a designer get a little bit bored of doing that same old thing, you then make a change and it kind of goes forward from that. But I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Or, because I, I, like, I thought we were getting somewhere and then all of a sudden you're like back five years ago. Yeah. Okay, wait, what just happened? But also understand for them to like again. I think for an Ian and a Shane, I think it's different because they were they're the they're the rare breed of designers. They were the four the four the 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 forerunners, right? They were the ones that are like holding the torch and leading us through that dark cave and telling us, "Trust me, let's go towards the end. Let's go towards let's go towards the end." And I think for somebody that's kind of you know the the innovators, the ones that are kind of pushing the boundaries and breaking through, it must be a little bit disconcerting to see like you know the things that you were referencing. 10 years ago are just now being introduced into the zeitgeist five years ago or have just come kind of kind of come back in again so it's also like it for, like that's why I, so I guess that's why cohen said it's, it's it must be like groundhog day to them because they've essentially done everything that's been happening now now because i think you know if you was able to pull out some archive pieces of um, hood by air which i'm i'd hope imagine <sighs> Just imagine if Hubayet did one of those. Do you remember? Because I think every, I'm not sure if it's every couple of years or every few years, um, Comme des Garçons, um, Dover Street, sorry, Dover Street Market, um, or it's essentially, well, yeah, the Comme des Garçons universe, but Dover Street Market essentially do this great little market thing where they have all of their in-house brands, mostly Comme des Garçons, um, maybe Junior, maybe some Noir and other stuff, right? And they basically have it sold for 75% off, right? So you get Comme des Garçons, home shirts, that usually 600 pounds or 700 dollars um sold um for you for 120 or something stupid like that right imagine if hood by air did the same thing were able to sell some of their archive pieces some of the pieces that didn't maybe make it to market or some of the sample pieces of some of the stuff that fit models were wearing imagine if you were able to buy some of that stuff and wear it now people would think it's like a cool new brand that just entered into the market it wouldn't look it wouldn't look out of date at all same with you know if you bought vintage helmet lang help vintage um raf some piece of moogler um all the iconic designers out there who people are kind of referencing nowadays number nine there's stuff that kind of looks of the time now why is it because what's currently going on is what they were referencing 10 12 20 years ago which is fucking scary really and shows you just how far ahead those guys were hey, but you know because there's a lot of shit there's a lot of there's shit lot, yeah and everything has to be smooth and yeah. validation there's a lot of validation happening right now so people are just like allowing and they want validation first first yeah before so I that exactly. they can get started on the work exactly. <laughs> and i'm like wait hey, and that's something um that's that's something i've kind of battled with i think over the time i think it might have been and it's not it's not a bad it's not something to say bad about um, him in general but i think it might be something about um it might have been a process of trying to just just being desperate to get put on because i remember this kind of language being spoken about quite often during the whole kanye and virgil upstart when when kanye was starting making clothes these collaboration with apc and Virgil was starting to get going with Pyrex and stuff. I do remember the phrase of like learning out loud in public, right? In real time. 
being used quite often. And I think for someone like a Virgil or someone like a Kanye, they probably did seem like there was a time limit. They had to kind of make it in a really short period of time. They did, they couldn't waste their window of kind of um, impact because they were kind of red hot during that time, but they're still red hot now. But they had such a hold on culture, such a hold on what was going on that they had to strike while the iron is hot. So they had to just really ID. They kind of I have to ideate, yeah, ideate, right? Make loads of iterations and really put out every single concept they're doing, every idea they're doing, and just fucking throw it out there on the internet. And at that time too, if you remember a few years ago, Instagram was a real kind of machine gun approach of of getting out content. Nowadays, people are a little bit more. Um, deliberate with how they put out things and what they're talking about and who gets to see what and what they're actually showing out in public but in the beginning stages if you remember it's kind of similar to the waves that we're kind of seeing on twitter right where twitter back in the day was a bit more wild and a little bit more uh, um, gung-ho you could just kind of fire from the hip now people are a little bit more conscious of it don't want to get cancelled same sort of thing happened with instagram you just kind of throw everything out there but i think not to it's not a bad thing because i think in general i think if you're like a virgil or a kind you just wanted to get out there you wanted to be you wanted to kind of put your flag in the ground and say, look, I'm a designer. Here's what I can make and really kind of stake your ground. And in general, I, I would imagine most of the opportunities that those guys got came some way, came by some way, um, came some way through that kind of, you know, sticking stuff up on Instagram where people kind of reach out to you and say, oh my God, wow, I saw that hoodie you made. Or oh, wow, I saw that collaboration. Or oh, wow, I saw this server. And they want to kind of work with you. So I think it kind of was a means to an end in general. But I think the bad thing about it was that the kids saw that sort of stuff. And instead of making, I think the good thing that Virgil and Kanye done during that period of showing people, just put your, put your work out there, showcase all the public, is that there wasn't a filter, right? Just show it out there. It doesn't matter. I'm learning in, I'm learning in real time. And, my, and they kind of were very assured that they were going to get better in time, right? Because that's the comp- that's going to... That's a self-confidence that kind of probably self-separates them from you know, most people, that they're very confident in that I will, essentially, I will eventually get there. This is my first draft, but I'm just putting my first draft out there because I'm brave and I'm not scared. I'm not going to... I remember Virgil saying a few times that um, something along the lines of like he doesn't want to... Um, um, he knows that a lot of his friends have loads of some of the best ideas sitting on a PSD file somewhere, right? That haven't been kind of made into a physical or real product or any sort of way, shape or form. So that kind of putting stuff out there was a lesson to everyone to be told but i think the kids got the wrong end of the stick and they started doing a thing of like you know with it, what what people do with, with the word entrepreneur they started putting that in their bio um as a form of validation as what ian's saying instead of doing the work first so they want to get the recognition from the name or from the label or from just maybe putting out one flyer instead of actually doing the work which is which which is actually making sure people are coming to your event right creating a little community creating a network um having some importance or relevancy within your media area or within your collective friendship group and then from there working it backwards and then showing the internet the stuff that you're doing but not going from the end of like i'm an entrepreneur but you have no business to show for it you're not making any money you're working a nine to five i mean it doesn't make any sense right um and that's kind of the part i don't really like but i guess in general that's probably the the one of the crux of the internet or social media that we kind of have to break right? Because essentially that's what social media is, right? People just want to be recognition. Like, you know, that's why people go to festivals and just stick their phone up at people while whilst they're playing, right? Instead of just actually enjoying the event. Um, they want everyone to know that they're there as opposed to enjoying the time that they're actually there. So I think, again, over time, I'm optimistic that the kids will see that social media is a great, and I think social media is like, um, is a is a great tool but it's also another world it's not necessarily the real world it doesn't necessarily correlate that because you get all your work out on social media that essentially is going to correlate into you collaborating with ikea or making a collaboration with coca-cola it doesn't really work that way right so the timings aren't the same right just because you can get something up on social media doesn't mean it's essentially going to materialize into a project or a collaboration so you probably so i think what would happen in the future hopefully i'm optimistic that social media will go will get back to being a place where you can show what you've done right boom i did this i did that i did this but not recognition it's like the end product right getting really good at painting getting really good at drawing getting really good at making things getting really good at making events at speaking whatever it may be and then choosing what you want to put up there because i remember even a small example there was um there's a subreddit i'm always on uh called stand up right because I've, I've always kind of wanted to do stand-up comedy but i've kind of been scared to kind of go out and do it my own my own but i remember 
reset there's always a there's always a thread of somebody uploading a clip of themselves like you know go to their first open mic and then say hey guys this is my first open mic um the style's a bit shaky i would like to give my thoughts and opinions and i never really and it really always rubbed me up the wrong way it's like why would you want people to give you why would you want feedback on your first ever stand-up comedy appearance right um on stage because you know by and large unless you're like one of the rare you know one in ten talents out there you know it's going to be shit right even if even a 10 year old messy if a 10 year old messy was able to post somewhere in a forum and say hey guys i want to make a professional footballer what do you guys think i don't really have a reference because you're 10 years old right you might look good playing around under 11s and stuff but there's no way i can compare you to an adult because you're 10 years old right same way with stand-up comedy like there's no there's no point of you showing me a video of you going on stage for the first time because what advice can I give you apart from just keep going with it, right? Or, um, it, but then imagine the worst part of it. Imagine if you're really terrible that first time um, and I tell you you're terrible. Then what? Does your dream get crushed? Do you completely stop again? Like, that's not the right way to kind of go about and use those kind of feedbacks. And I always thought it was really strange people would do that. But again, it goes back to the recognition thing, right? They want everyone to know that they're doing something. They want the recognition of like, oh, wow, props, congratulations that you've done that, as opposed to actually doing the work, which then goes back again to another um, anecdote of... Um, Remember, I think I said a few times about the people that go and sign up to half marathons or really popular races like London Marathon, which I never fucking get into. Actually, I got signed up to it. I remember. Shit, I forgot. Um, the London Marathon and stuff, they sign up to it. And supposed to be those kind of marathons. I think they stopped nowadays. But beforehand, when you sign up and you get a place, they would send you an email or like a shareable graphic that you could share on your socials to say, hey, oh, congratulations. You're one of the few people that got a place into Next Gen Marathon. Start training now. We can't wait to see you, right? But what what happened without them realizing was that that graphic became a validation. That graphic became the medal. That that was that that's like you already won the race. So they'd share that on social. They'd get all the endorphin hits, all the kind of you know clicks and likes that would make them feel amazing and happy about themselves. And then they just wouldn't train and they wouldn't turn up. And then you got some of the biggest races in the world, uh, which are you know some of the biggest sponsors. They got all the media coverage, right? Wherever you want, so in some of the most beautiful locations in the world. Um, have now got you know half of the attendees or a quarter of the attendees not turning up on race day because they feel like they've already done it because they've got the shareable graphic and again that goes back to recognition instead of doing the work let's continue again before you start like before you take two hundred dollars to go get an LLC you yeah. certified on Instagram first so, like, yeah. like, so you want like some sort of validation or you want some sort of title or name yeah. and that's we we in history know that sucks you know yeah, artists can't true. sit in front of a thing and write Boss guy didn't write the title of like yeah. His work this before he started doing it, it. Yeah, like you can't title it first. You fuck it up. It's you can have a goal. You can have a dream with the title. You can have a cool board. You can look at this word that you want to be. You want to be a millionaire. Sure, look at it, market manage yourself, and look at it and do that. Right. But you're not gonna put that title on yourself until you have it. Exactly, and I think again that that goes back to again. I think the. Um... The hesitancy that I've always had of putting on, but that's why sometimes in my bio or my Instagram, I always, I always put, you know, you know, crazy, stupid shit. I think now at the moment I might have stay at home dad, but I've always been really uncomfortable with putting the actual bio of the stuff that I'm doing, especially if I'm not doing that thing, right? When someone says DJ and you're not playing anywhere, it's like, you're not really a DJ then, are you really, isn't it, right? You're um, essentially in my head, DJ will be like, you know, playing in one or two places and you're getting paid for it, right? Um just little kind of like things that will kind of classify you as like entrepreneur. Okay, cool. Are you running a business? Is that business um, able to generate a certain amount of income? Is it allowing you to not work? Cool. Entrepreneur then. Business owner. Is that cool? Is that true? Small business owner. Yeah. Have you got many small businesses or whatever? Maybe artists. Are you making artwork that's being shown regularly in galleries? Do you have exhibitions every single year? Whatever. There's certain things that you kind of have to do criteria wise that will kind of give you the name. But Again, I think it's maybe important to kind of like Ian saying, start off with the work first and then look for the titles later. Look for the titles that fit you after because you have to also imagine if you end up becoming successful, you end up becoming well known, there's going to be enough people out there giving you titles as it is, right? There's going to be enough people trying to box you in, trying to classify what work you do, trying to put it into nice snappy sublines and, and fucking um, titles on blogs and whatever it may be the last thing you want to do is do that yourself right it's, it's going to be it's, it's going to one time there's going to be a time in your life if you become successful where it's going to be annoying the labels they put on you so the last thing you want to do in the time that you have to be creative the time you have to be um free and to kind of have your mind open is to actually put a label on yourself and box yourself in or to kind of again have these false sense of recognition that don't really marry up to anything and you know it deep down too right i know some of my creative friends are like that some people in the scene you know it when you're just fluffing it when you're just bullshitting when you're trying to have you know what's that word called faking it till you make it and nah i'm not really a fan of that i think you have to do the work fake it till you make it maybe in terms of like 
I've heard of people doing making fake record labels that don't actually exist. Or no, that exists, but it's like a one man job. But again, you're doing the work, right? You're making a you're actually making a SoundCloud page. You're making loads of music, and you're making different types of music for these fictional artists, and you're releasing these fictional artists' music. You have a separate Instagram page for each fictional artist, but you're doing the work. It's faking it till you make it in one sense, but there's work behind it, right? It's not just a a thing of like record label owner and there's no records where are the records right that's the thing you have to kind of have to do going forward so again a really interesting interview i really recommend you check it out um it's uh shane oliver and ian mcshay or, or ian Isaiah. Isaiah, sorry i keep mispronouncing his name but it's on Kerwin frost um youtube i'll link it on the show notes for you to check out but it's a really really cool interview again for anyone that's been a, a fan of the scene as much as i have who has been part of the scene as long as i have who has kind of maybe just even just discovered the scene over the last couple of years and you want to get an idea as to who the forefathers were who kind of birthed it who was a really important person who kind of who laid the groundwork for us to kind of walk the path that we're walking now read this listen to this interview um listen to it again and again and again in its full entirety just have it on especially if you've got youtube app on your phone or my youtube on my iphone i've got youtube app the premium i pay for five pound you can just have it playing on the background you can maybe get the video convert it to an mp3 and add it to your phone just listen to the whole thing entirely it's about two hours but it's complete it's full of so many gems a really good interview and again like i said i think because it's Kerwin interviewing them somebody again who's come up from the scene who's kind of had the right education who's kind of been around who's seen the right things he can appreciate them for who they are and asking really permanent questions it seems like a fan seeing somebody who knows what to ask and again they have a personal relationship too that helps so it's a really cool interview i recommend you check it out um ian um ian and shane oliver talking about the origins of hood by air and i think it's due to come back soon as well so look out for that too coming to you very very soon